Okay, folks, this is going to be a film review for Captain America, the first Avenger, which will henceforth be referred to as simply Captain America. I'm going to cut the first Avenger part out because despite the chortliness, which is probably not a word, of my speech or the speed of my speech, I am suffering from not a hangover because I don't get hangovers, but whatever my version of a hangover is. Too many steve last night. Anyway, Captain America, as it will be known henceforth, uh, is a superhero film based on the comic book character of the same name, unsurprisingly, and is part of this Marvel Comics behemoth conglomerate franchise thing that they've got going on that's been going since what like Iron Man 2007 something like that so the film stars Chris Evans in the leading role as well as the likes of Tommy Lee Jones and Hugo Weaving and is directed by Joe Johnson who if you don't know is the crazed lunatic that brought us Jumanji in what the late 1990s at this point. Captain America was released in the summer of 2011, so I mean, you're talking about a summer blockbuster. I did not see it at the time. And the film is predominantly set during the war years of the 1940s, and its locales include the UK uh, and southern and central Europe, as well as, for obvious reasons, the United States, which I love. I mean, I love that time period. I mean, the contemporary cultural and historical context of the film is sort of a continuation of a long tradition of what I would call purity nostalgia. I don't know if that's an official piece of terminology to describe this kind of impulse within art, but purity nostalgia, at least from my understanding, is kind of going back to look at a more, a more pure age, you know? Plutarch in ancient Rome was very famous for this. And I mean, you go back further, you know, Xenophon, uh, who wrote uh, the story about the kind of, the escape over the Persian Empire of the of the Greeks, you know, that Warriors, the movie Warriors was based on, but also there was these ideas of purity, and I think America and its cult cultural state right now does kind of want to hark back to uh, those famous characters or those famous uh, feelings, the feeling of purity or the feeling of purposefulness, pur purposefulness that it had, say, during the Second World War, when it would consider its heyday to be, so... The kind of the cultural context in which this film appears to us is very intense if you want to look at it in in that sense. Uh, the film itself is a quasi prequel. It follows the transformation of a weedy but principled young man repeatedly rejected from military service into a superhuman augment uh, with the aid of a classically, you know, kind of exiled, ponderously ingenious German scientist. You know, it's like, yeah, well, you know, like classic Einstein. I mean, that guy. Something about Einstein has created entire, an entire character trope within art, which I find quite interesting. In a battle to save humanity from its doom at the hands of an insane, also superhuman, coincidentally, Nazi occultist touting advanced weaponry and a private army of faceless goons in a battle over an ancient Nordic artifact capable of channeling energy from another dimension. In terms of plots, um, I, I, that's, uh, I'm a real softie for crazy shit like that, you know, like, that's like a weak spot for me. Nazi occultism, 1940s style, um, you know, it's, yeah, everything about it is just awesome to me. So it was budgeted at $140 million and it grossed $371 million in the box office, which is, I mean, it's a big blockbuster grade budget and it seems to have grossed, uh, you know, you're talking more than 100%, you know, returns on that. So that's a pretty decent investment, I suppose, if you're Paramount, I think. Uh, the transformation scene, in terms of the things I didn't like about the film, transformation scene was a little simplistic. I would have liked a little more scientific jargon and accompaniment to it. Didn't really get it. Um, and also, having just mentioned the 1940s thing, for me, there wasn't enough swing music in this film. If you're gonna have the 1940s, you're gonna have swing music. Uh, and the supernatural element of the film, you say, well, it's not as though it's, uh, you know, just a purely 1940s, you know, it has no sci-fi in it, you know, no superhero stuff. No, you can use that anyway, even if you have a supernatural accompaniment or whatever. You could have easily just augmented it with, like, modern electro swing, which would have kind of compensated for that and made sense, kind of. In, in a contemporary sense, it helps you to link the past and the present draw parallels between the two different time periods if you look at the resurgence of swing music now which is sort of based on maybe music purity nostalgia i could be wrong so what things do i like some of the people that were gallivanting around during the 1930s in the war era in europe might as well have been comic book characters uh, this is sort of art imitating life which to some extent everything is i suppose or most things are uh, i love anything to do with creepy occult nazi stuff and it fits perfectly with the Nordic stuff and the, action, and the actual pagan blood myths of Nazi ideology. The film is long also, which is another thing I like about it. 
Uh, it's rare that finding out there's another 45 minutes to go comes as a pleasant surprise instead of feeling like a chore. Uh, and the story itself is very engrossing. Evan's character is intriguing and relatable. Basically, the film is a puberty-free coming-of-age story, for me, anyway. He's usually a coming-of-age story, they just... It's not that he has to come of age, he has come of age emotionally or in the sense of his principles or his morals, but his body is literally come of age. That's the interesting thing about this Captain America thing, it's like, it's like a... It, yeah, it's like a weird protein enzyme crazy scientist induced coming of age story and he has to retain his principles after the transformation Which is the real coming of age Stylistically the film reminds me a little of Captain uh, sorry of Sky Captain in the world of tomorrow Which I think was released in 2003 and one is one of my favorite films stylistically. It's a very interesting film It reminds me a lot of that uh, insofar as the combination of technology of different eras uh, or I suppose in this case a future era or a science, I, I don't know, a supernatural era. Uh, maybe a sort of hint of fallout thrown in there too, kind of reminds me of that. The film does a great job of hooking itself up to the wider and ongoing Marvel film franchise with the likes of Tony Stark and the Artifact, which is of course also mentioned, or the Cube, which is also mentioned in the, uh, in the Thor films and the Avenger films, the Cube. Okay, so characters and script. Uh, Weaving's portrayal is great. Hayley Atwell and Natalie Dormer, you know, I am not worthy uh, for them to be on screen at the same time. I'm kind of hyperventilating here. And Tommy Lee Jones is great in the role of Tommy Lee Jones, which is the role he always plays, and he was great. Uh, the script is well written, utilizing one-liners a little, but not excessively so. Uh, the film is thoroughly good. It's easily one of the best films I've seen this year. Initially, I avoided it because I assumed that not only would it be difficult to relate to from a British perspective, but that it would also, I mean, having to do with an actual character that was created for the American war effort during the 40s but that it would also drip with a kind of cheese that can only be produced with the aid of a high fructose lavished aerosol can. In fact, I was surprised by how little smegma adorned the end product. I will see you guys later on. You can find this film on Netflix, by the way, so if you have Netflix, it should stream nice and pretty and smooth in HD. See you later.